Nós estamos aqui com Cade Metz, ele é repórter do New York Times e está na frente de algumas discussões sobre tecnologias emergentes e seus sentidos filosóficos. Ele também está prestes a lançar um livro que promete chacoalhar este universo. Cade, thank, thank you for being with us today. Glad to be here, particularly on the roof. What a what a setting. Yeah, what a setting. So um, you were here today for a speech about artificial intelligence, and I learned that you're in one of the persons related to the New York Times School. So what exactly is this thing about? The New York Times School is a relatively new effort, a sort of a, a, a joint effort between the New York Times and Sotheby's, the auction house. And the idea is to uh, educate the next generation, not only in the ways of, of journalism, um, but maybe uh, in the skills that, uh, that, a, that a journalist needs that can be applied to other things. Um, so I taught a course with the Times School in New York last summer about uh, basically how to do my job. As an artificial intelligence reporter, what does that mean? Um, what are the issues I'm covering, including these philosophical issues we'll discuss? Um, um, but also, you know, how I think about those things and, and how I go about my reporting and maybe how young journalists could do the same. Great. I think that um, most of the times think, people think about artificial intelligence from a very high level perspective, whereas in practice there's lots of data cleaning, organizing stuff, receiving data, doing some protocol stuff. Do you think that, that we're moving to a situation where all that will be automatic or we still need professionals that are trained in database and very basic skills? You absolutely need need professionals and, and humans working in other capacities. I mean, what we have recently over the past few years is the <laughs> rise of systems that can do certain tasks on their own and, and essentially learn to do those tasks. So image recognition is a good idea. It's a good example. Um, if you use Facebook, um, we now have systems that can analyze thousands of images and they can learn to recognize a face. But humans still have to curate that data, all those faces that it learns from, and they have to label it. They have to physically draw what's called a bounding box around those faces. So the system, as it analyzes all those faces, knows that that's a face, right? That sort of thing goes on in spades. Like you still need humans to do a lot of the dirty work before the machines can learn these tasks. Do you think that this is creating some sort of new professional, something, something different from the past and it's a second class profession or do you think that this is just uh, some some freelancing stuff that people are doing on no, the bike? It, it is it's a huge industry. I wrote a piece on this recently. I traveled to India and I went to four or five offices across India as well as uh, the U.S. where <coughs> people do this work exclusively. It's a multi-billion dollar business and all they do all day is they label images or label sounds. Um, I went to a, a, an office in New Orleans where they were taking in literally the sound of people coughing into their phone and labeling the sound. That's so amazing. It's amazing. So for instance, um, you know, what does a, a bad cough sound like? One that might be indicative mm -hmm. of an illness or disease versus what does a good cough sound like? And if you label enough of those, you can feed them into a system that learns to recognize that, that itself, right? So in essence, in theory at least, you could have an automated system that would listen to you cough and try to diagnose your problem and maybe get you to a doctor. Great. Right? But first you need people on the ground there in New Orleans, right across the street from the Superdome in New Orleans, labeling those images. Do you think that we're heading to general AI or actually something different? At the moment we're heading towards something different. Now, some people in the field will, uh, will tell you um, that general AI is around the corner. You know, there are some very important thinkers in the field, people building this stuff. There's a lab in London called DeepMind, which is now yeah, owned right. by Google's parent company. They fundamentally believe they are on that path. Uh, there's, a, there's a lab in Silicon Valley in the US called OpenAI, yeah, which I know is both. set up a, as kind of an answer to DeepMind, started by Elon Musk, uh -huh. the American entrepreneur. Those two labs believe they're on that path and they make a certain argument about why that's the case. Uh, I think they're, 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 making, uh, they're making a leap from what is possible today. Um, they, are, they have developed systems that are very good at playing very complex games. The game of Go, for instance, yeah, the ancient sure. game of Go. 
<coughs> very, very complex video games, um, three-dimensional games that require um, what is, or at least the ability to mimic collaboration, okay, between different different agents, as they say, uh, in the game. I heard, I, I, by the way, I read your piece on that. It was a great oh, piece. Thank you. Yes, thank also, you. go thank ahead, you. please. But, I mean, a game is one thing. The real world is another. Exactly. And in, in essence, to duplicate what they have done in these games, you need a simulation, <laughs> a reliable simulation of the real world. You need the ability to digitally recreate everything that's around us, you know, with a certain fidelity, right? That's beyond us right now. Um, once you create that, then you need a, enough processing power, right, and enough time um, to explore all the possibilities within that world, to recreate everything um, that shapes us and has shaped us as, as we grew up and as we learned and as we became adults. That's, 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 a, long, that's, a, that's a long road. Yeah. You, you know what? My take on this is sort of ontological, actually. And it has to do with my readings on John Searle. You know this guy? Right, sure. I, I really like him. And basically what I think is there is a, at least a three uh, intentional directions that we can take. One is when we change a state of the world to, to match something in the mind. For instance, I'm, I'm thirsty, so there is a glass of water. I'm going to put the water inside my body, so I will change where the water is. Let's put it very simple. Right in a very simple fashion, and, and that will, will eliminate the necessity for that cognition. There is another direction that goes from the, the outside to the inside, which is, for instance, you know how to play goal. I don't know how to play it. So goal, the rules of goal are inside your brain. I will learn with you changing my own brain to accomplish that behavior. So that's learning. That's, that's a different direction. But then there is a third direction, which is a mind-mind direction. For instance, suppose I'm writing a, a, a piece, and I, a fictional piece, and I have a character, and then I have a second character, and I feel that this second character actually doesn't match the first one, and there's a dissonance in this piece. So I change the character, which is a mental representation, to match this first mental representation. And by that means, I change my mind to match a state of the mind. It's a mind-mind coordination, it's consonance, it's totally abstract. In my opinion, the, the very, the deepest problem is that we're doing that all the time and we're, we're creating consonance about stuff and dissonance about stuff inside our minds. And when we act, we translate that to the world. So since we don't have any sort of productivity tools related not, not only to, to natural language processing, but to abstract yes, processing, right inside any sort of whatever we can call artificial synthetic brain, right. we're not heading in that direction. We're heading to a different direction. We're much more in a, in a Skinner box right. than in the mind box, in I, my opinion. I, what's your take on that? No, no, it's a, it's a good point. And you know, my, my talk today, like you're talking, uh, apparently it seems to, to an intellectual audience, right? But I was talking today when I gave my speech to, to a lay audience. And, um, I'm terrible at that. Oh, wait, wait. Well, no, but it's the same argument. I made a similar argument, but just in much simpler terms, right? I mean, the truth of the matter is, you're a neuroscientist. We don't know how the brain works. Exactly. Right? So you, you, you can explain it very easily to anyone. We don't understand the brain. How can you hope to recreate the brain if you don't understand it? <laughs> right? I mean, just a, okay, and you settle the you argument. You settle it. the argument. Okay, so let's, let's figure it out first before we start talking about recreating this thing and doing everything that you and I can do. Perfect. That was just perfect. Now that you mentioned, what do you think about those neuromorphic ships? What are they bringing to the table? Well, I, th I think before you start talking about the neuromorphic chips, and we'll get there, right? okay. meaning a chip that is designed sort of in the image of the brain, yeah. what, what, is, what is happening, and maybe we should step back a little bit more, when we talk about these systems that can learn tasks on their own, we're talking about what's called a neural network, right? I know you know this, but you know, it, It'll explain to yeah, it's, a, it's a mathematical system, okay? It, it was first conceived in the 1950s and has now started to work. It's a mathematical system that can learn a task by analyzing data. So again, it can analyze thousands of photos of people's faces. It learns to recognize a face, okay? It's starting to work not only with image recognition, but speech recognition, language translation, language generation, you know, feeding those conversations into a system. It learns to 
produce a conversation. What um, is happening now is that there is a huge effort centered around these giant American companies, Google, Facebook, et cetera, and many startups um, in Silicon Valley and elsewhere, in China, in Europe, to build chips specifically to train these, these neural network models. Sure, okay? I know that. And um, a lot of people believe that as you build these chips, you know, these capabilities are just going to increase. Okay? You need more data, you need more computing power, there's an effort to build it. Um, the neuromorphic idea is, is sort of a subset of that. And a lot of people think that the way these chips are being built will get you only so far. And what you need is a chip built more like these neural networks. So the neur a neural network is called that because it's built in the, the image of the neurons in your brain, the web of neurons in your brain. The idea is to build a chip that mimics that idea. Okay, so the fundamental idea at this point is let's build hardware that works like the software and is better able to train train these systems. And, and you're seeing these, I wrote a piece recently about a neuromorphic chip under development in China, which is another big center for, for these types of ideas. Um, they had put a neuromorphic chip in, in a bicycle. It's like a self-driving bicycle. Yeah, I know that. And at this point, that's a, that's a nice demo, right? Uh, who really needs a self-driving bicycle? Not, <laughs> exactly. not, not you or me, but it's a way of demonstrating you know, a, a chip of this kind that in small ways you can get it to work, right? We're a long way from the point where, you know, these sorts of chips are in our phones, but, th but that's the direction, the, even the hardware business is And, and as you said, it's, it resembles a, a network, but not necessarily the brain as it process information because exactly. we don't know how to do it, right? We don't. And how yet, does it, sorry. No, no, you're right. It's, it's, it's a loose approximation of something we're not completely sure of, yeah, right? That, that, yeah. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Kate, it was such a pleasure talking with you. Thank you really so much. It. Thank you. All right. E para você que nos acompanhou até aqui, nosso muito obrigado. Semana que vem estaremos novamente com quem vem causando em São Paulo. Até lá. Música